Let's get Eurified. Alright, considering it's the 10th anniversary of the Love Live anime, I thought it'd be fitting to celebrate with a top 10 list. So here we are with another top 10 countdown video. But this time is different, you see, because this time I'm gonna be talking about Love Live characters. And if you're remotely familiar with my work, you'll know all about how much I adore this series. I mean, my channel might as well be completely devoted to Love Live at this point, so listing out my favorite Love Live ships was only inevitable. Anyway, just like my last top 10 video, this list will consist of Love Live ships from just the anime. However, I must point out some slight differences. This time I will not include any honorable mentions, simply due to the fact that I don't really have any love life ships beyond the ones listed here, at least ones that I feel that strongly about. Second, and this is important, I will not include the love life ships that were listed on my top 10 Yuri ships video. I would only be repeating what I said after all. And just to recap, here are my top favorite love life ships from that video. Spoilers! Number 4 is Kanan and Mari, number 3 is Ayumu and Yu, number 2 is Nozomi and Ellie, and number 1 is Niko and Maki. And by the way, those are just my top 4 favorite Love Live ships, not their rankings in that video. So with that out of the way, I'll be counting down my favorite ships after those four. So I guess this video should really be called my top 14 to 5th Love Live Yuri ships list. Or something to that effect. Alright, let's get on with the shipping. Number 14, Kasumi and Shizuku, Love Live Nijikazaki. Let's start things off with two of the most adorable Kohais you can never ask for. We find out pretty quickly that these two have a fairly close relationship in the school idol club, and like any good first year Love Live friendship, it's as pure as the driven snow. Not surprisingly, it was the events of episode 8 that really solidified Kasu Shizu for me. An anxious and self-conscious Shizuku feared the prying judgment of others if they were to learn about her true self. In this case, a sweet drama nerd who loves watching old timey plays which is really no joke of an anxiety. In fact, when I was in high school, everyone was scared to death of being exposed as a Kim Possible fan. Son of a bitch! All I wanted to say was what's the sitch to someone. So with Shizuku's anxiety reaching a boiling point, we got a surprise intervention by Kasumi, and she pulls out all the stops. A fun date, a reassuring speech, a love confession, and a forehead flick. Everything you need to do to make a girl fall head over heels for you. My one major gripe, however, is their almost non-existent follow-up in the next season. Seriously, they barely even share a conversation conversation with each other in Season 2. Not sure if this is because they wanted to have Shizuku become more focused on writing naughty Yuri fanfiction of her friends, and then telling her friends about how she was writing naughty Yuri fanfiction about them. Wait. Huh. Maybe Kasu Shizu isn't as pure as I thought. Number 13, Katori and Umi, Love Live. What? How could I have a second year Mew ship not be the complete trio, you ask? Well, as a matter of fact, I do ship the second years in every possibility, even as an OT3. But I have to admit that Kota Umi just nearly wins over the rest. Why is that? Well, simply put, I have a soft spot for Yuri pairings that include a feminine girl and a somewhat masculine girl. Case in point, Kanamari, Nozoeli, and a couple more on this list. Now, much of why I ship these two has less to do with their interactions in the anime, and more so with just how I personally see them interacting in a romantic setting. I mean, an obvious thing to point out is that they share... Eh, very few interactions on their own together. So in this case, I just like how well their personalities pair together. Imagine an easily flustered but mostly mature girl at the mercy of a very alluring and affectionate young woman. And when I say alluring, I really mean it. I can imagine many scenarios where Katori pulls this devilish stunt and poor Lumi has to oblige to anything she says. Anything. Although in retrospect, you don't have to try particularly hard to soften up Umi. Just put on a Meg Ryan film and you're good to go. Hell, even an Amy Schumer movie. Alright, maybe not that. Number 12, Hanayo and Rin, Love Life. Hey, here's another example of a feminine masculine ship. Until we get to season two, of course. Oh yeah. First of all, who the hell doesn't ship Rinpana? They're a classic rice and curry combo, as I like to say. One absolutely needs the other in order to achieve perfect harmony. In this case, Hanayo's the rice, of course, and she'll happily accept being topped off with Rin's piping hot, delicious curry. Yeah, pour it all over. Get it nice and steamy. Oh, yes. And now it's ready to eat.
On top of being childhood friends and having contrasting personalities, there's a lot of reasons to ship these two. They arguably have some of the most touching and well-told character arcs in all of Love Live, which both are carried through thanks to the actions of their significant other. Ren, and technically Maki, gave Hanyo the support she needed to follow her dreams in becoming an idol by joining Honoka and the others, and Hanyo repaid the favor by giving Ren the confidence to accept her feminine side and perform proudly as the beautiful young woman that she is. Then they lovingly embraced each other in a tuxedo and a wedding dress, which I I assume is a subtle attempt by the writers to make you think that there's some kind of inkling of romantic tension between the two. Is that just me, or am I going crazy? Number 11, Kanon and Chisato, Love Live Superstar. Ah yes, what is a Love Live protagonist without her supportive, ambiguously gay childhood friend? Like Rin and Hanayo, these two childhood sweethearts also provide valuable support to each other throughout the series, specifically their self-esteem and courage. The writing for each character arc was a little clunky, but the message is there loud and clear. Kanon, who became Chisato's very first friend, gave her the help and guidance to find her passion in life. Then, feeling an immense amount of gratitude, Chisato in return gave Kanon the courage to stand on stage and put that beautiful voice of hers out there again. Also, if you pay close attention, you really feel the gratitude from Chisato throughout the series. Almost every action she takes is to support her future wife. They only explicitly say this in the anime, but that was Chisato's lifelong goal, to be the perfect wife for Kano. In fact, there was a scene of them as children playing house together, but they had to cut it from the anime because they also played Let's Visit the Fertility Clinic. So yeah, many things to love about Liela's obligatory childhood friends couple. However, the only gripe I have is the total absence of any yandere tendencies from Chisato. Seriously, they had such a wonderful pattern going on. Number 10, Yu and Setna, Love Live Nijigazaki. Yes, I mentioned that I shipped Yu and Ayumu already, but I do on rare occasions ship certain characters with multiple girls, and I can't think of a better example than the harem queen herself, Takasaki Yu. But for now, let's stick to my second favorite Yu ship, shall we? Something about Yu Setsu tickled my particular fancy, and it mainly has to do with my slightly offset interpretation of these two. To me, Yu reminds me of the average everyday kind of character, like the protagonist of a romantic comedy or something, kind, relatable, but just not all that remarkable as a person. And one day, she happens to meet Setsuna, the bombshell hottie, spectacular in every way, and completely unreachable. Against all odds, Yu manages to win Setsuna's heart and sweep her off her feet. Then the two live happily ever after together. Point is, Yu and Setsuna have quite a contrast in their personal lives, yet can still obtain the status of lovers. And I'm a sucker for stories of underdogs getting the love interest in the end. After all, it gives me a lot of hope. Basically, these two perfectly embody the rom-com formula, but with Yuri. And that makes it better because as I said so. Also, just like Chisato, I got a lot of joy imagining Setsuna showing immense gratitude to you for lighting a fire under her again. I can only imagine how things could have played out in episode 10. You know, the scene with them all alone in the music room, bathed by moonlight, the mood perfectly set up, then Setsuna thanks you for everything she's done, and goes on about doing anything to repay her. Then we see the contours of Setsuna's body, silhouetted by moonlight, as she drops her clothes to the ground. Then we cut to a flustered but eager you, who watches Setsuna slowly walk up to her, and gently sits on top of her lap. Then they both stare intensely into each other's eyes, and all of a sudden their lips Number 9, Sumire and Cuckoo, Love Live Superstar. What? These two had one of the most romantic moments in all of Love Live, so shouldn't they be higher on this list, you say? Well, like most beloved things in life, they come with a grain of salt. And in Sumi Cuckoo's case, it's a rather complicated grain of salt. Right off the bat, when I first saw these two interact with each other, I had growing concerns that they would essentially be Nikumaki 2.0, and that there wouldn't be anything unique about their relationship. Now, of course, they definitely share similarities to Nikumaki in terms of their usual squabbling, but their Character development is what sets them apart by far. On a surface level, I do enjoy their back and forth bickering, and I would argue that their episode in season 2 is some of the best character writing in Love Live history. With, of course, romantic undertones so thick, you can line the walls of Fort Knox with it. However, I wouldn't be much of an internet armchair critic if I didn't point out some nagging issues. So after the events of episode 10, you know, after Sumire and Cuckoo finally made up and acknowledged their support to each other and their dedication to Liela, for some reason after that, they still remain fairly hostile to 
to each other. Manly Cuckoo, by the way. And what's even stranger is that after Season 2's Episode 9, they still have pretty much the same interactions. Now, of course, one might argue that they're simply being super tsundere for each other, and this is how they manifest their love. First of all, I would like to remind people that the second half to that word also exists. But regardless of that, you'd think that after two important character building events, these two would have a slightly different relationship. Probably one that's more mature and affectionate, with some light bickering sprinkled throughout. Now, an important thing to note is that Sumire was dead set on not letting Cuckoo go back to Shanghai, thanks to her support from Season 1. And I definitely acknowledge that as development in her relationship with Cuckoo. What I'm more perplexed by is her consistent arguing. Basically, it hasn't changed at all since the start of the series, as if the character moments between them haven't affected the way they interact with each other in the slightest. Anyway, all that doesn't mean I don't love the two of them with all my heart and soul. It was just jarring to see. That's all. I'm especially curious to see where the relationship will go in Season 3. Obviously, they can't just repeat the same drama between them again. Which means we're expecting nothing but good times, right? A man can dream. Number 8. Rina and I. Love Life, Nijigazaki. By the way, I forgot to point out that I have absolutely no exposure to the Nijigazaki girls, other than the anime. I have not played the School Idol Festival game, nor do I intend to play any other Love Life mobile game. So going into the show with no prior info, I sat back on my Lazy Boy chair and allowed the anime and my Yuri goggles to do their thing. And what do you know? It gave us a plethora of solid couples, one of which is the lovely dynamic duo, Rina and I. First of all, we got the complete opposites trope, which is an instant winner in my book, Secondly, they ended up being two of my favorite Nijigazaki girls, Rina being as cute as a button and having one of the best episodes of the season, and I having such an infectious personality and being the hottest girl of the bunch. Yes, even hotter than Katty. That's right, come and get me, bro. To be honest, what really sold this ship to me wasn't the superficial aspects, but rather, it was watching how much of a positive impact this relationship had on Rina. We learned in episode 6 that our silent little cutie pie idol was extremely timid when she entered Nijigazaki and struggled making friends with people. This anxiety of hers continuously crushed her spirit. That all changed, however, when the outgoing eye approached her and extended her hand out in friendship. This one single act changed Rena's life forever, and at that point, I was invested in seeing how their friendship would give Rena the much-needed joy and confidence that she eagerly strived to achieve. And boy oh boy did it deliver. Sure, it was a group effort thing that helped Rena realize her potential, but I was the one who ran to her girlfriend first and wanted to snuggle with her box form. That's some gay brownie points right there. Number 7, Emma and Katty, Love Live, Nijigazaki. Every Love Live generation has a powerhouse couple. Muse has Nozomi and Ellie, Aqua has Kanan and Mari, Liella has Sumire and Kuku, I guess, and Nijigazaki has Emma and Katty. The first thing I want to point out is how much these two surprised me. I, and no doubt many others, expected that Katty would most likely be paired with I in the anime. Obviously, there was the expectation of another blonde member being shipped with the hot blue slash purple haired girl of the group. And of course, what with Diver Diva being hotter than Liquid Magma and all that, but no, there was quite a strong focus on Emma and Katian in the anime, and right from the get-go, I was all in for it. These two definitely give off that old married couple vibe, and that's no hyperbole. Emma does a bang-up job taking care of Katian and making sure she stays happy and honest like any good caring wife would do, like waking her up in the morning, cleaning up her room, helping her put on clothes, making sure she doesn't get lost. Wait a minute. Does Katin have a mommy fetish? The main enjoyment I get from this ship is imagining the burst of happiness these girls get from spending time with each other. A prime example of that is their date montage in episode 5. Look how lovey-dovey they are. They complement each other so well because they make their lives so much fun and interesting. And if that ain't the cornerstone for a successful, fulfilling marriage, then I ain't qualified to call myself a pseudo-marriage counselor. Number 6. Chica and Rico and Chica and Yo. Love Live Sunshine. Alright, I'm doubling up a slot here because I genuinely cannot decide which of these two ships I love more. Let's start with Chica Rico first. One of the best first meetings in Love Live has to go to these two. I mean, how often can you say that you met your girlfriend after getting wet together? Right off the bat, we understand that Rico's calm level-headedness is meant to contrast Chica's undeterred idiosyncrasies. You know how much I love them opposites. They're pretty much in the same vein as Honoka and Umi, but just 20% less exaggerated and and about 50% more gay. Also, can I just take a moment to say how gorgeous Rico is, both in general and when she's on the receiving end of Chica shenanigans? What can be more entertaining than seeing a serious, down-to-earth good girl being pulled into the wild side? Catholic girl style 
baby. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't give major props to the godfather of Chikoriko, Kogi Hiroshi, who single-handedly lifted the ship into superstardom and is keeping it alive and sexy even to this day. Kudos, my friend. Kudos. Now where Chikoriko really falter, unfortunately, is our lack of follow-through in Season 2. I know, I know, this whole shebang about pandering to different shippers in the second season has been talked about to death at this point, but I can't help but feel a little insulted after seeing them go from an honest-to-goodness love confession to let's stay in this wacky and awkward place called the Friend Zone. What is this, a 90s sitcom? So let's move on to Chika and Yo next, shall we? Now one thing I should make clear is that I favor both ships in different ways. I like Chika and Rico's chemistry as a ship more, but I enjoy Chika and Yo's relationship and time spent together more so over the former. An obvious highlight for these two is their consistency throughout both seasons. Yo remains absolutely dedicated to her best friend's school idol ambitions and will follow her to the ends of the earth to see her accomplish it. The only thing she asks in return though is Chika's undivided love and attention. Something that I wanted to quickly mention is that the whole love triangle drama between the second years of Aqua felt like a prototype to the whole love triangle drama between the second years of Nijikazaki. Like it was almost the exact same situation. The protagonist and her childhood friend decide to start an idol club together. The protagonist is awestruck by an attractive sexy girl she'd never seen before. The protagonist tries her best to recruit that attractive sexy girl into the idol club. The childhood friend grows jealous of the relationship between the protagonist and the attractive sexy girl. And finally, the childhood friend makes a last ditch attempt to seduce the protagonist with her body. But at the end of the day, Jika and Yo really get my approval for being an absolutely unsinkable ship. Their loyalty and love for each other is truly admirable. A shining beacon that every childhood friend should strive to achieve. Also, I think this is the perfect time to bring this up, but my absolute undisputed favorite love live girl is Yo. So it'd be a grave injustice of me to not support her endeavors with all my heart and soul. Her happiness is my happiness. Her pain is my pain. And her love is my love. Just doing what any good fan would do. Number 5, Shiki and Mei, Love Live Superstar. This is what you've been waiting for, folks. How could I possibly make a Love Live list now without including one of the latest and greatest additions to our beloved Love Live shipping family? I wholeheartedly maintain that Shiki and Mei are a love letter to every Yuri fan of this series. We stuck with this franchise through thick and thin and poured every drop of sweat, love, and tears into it. And as a reward for our dedication, they gifted us with these two divine goddesses. Right off the bat, I knew that there was something truly special about them. The way Shiki constantly observes Mei, the way Mei would be all grumpy around Shiki, the way Shiki would tease Mei, the way Shiki gay panics over Mei's cuteness, the way Shiki would say Mei's name. God damn it, there's so much to talk about. Episode 4 alone made me question whether or not I was in an alternate reality where Love Live was being written by Yuri fanfic artists. In fact, if you were to ask anyone to watch that scene, I swear they would ask you if those two were in a relationship. Yuri goggles are totally unnecessary when it comes to Shiki and Mei, and that's what makes them a franchise milestone. I cannot get enough of them, and with the upcoming release of Season 3, I can only hope that they take Shiki and Mei to the next level. As it stands, they currently hold the highest possibility of any Love Live ship to make it to first base, and I'm talking about the chances of us seeing an on-screen kiss, considering all the Love Live animes that are slated to air. The only other equal contender to potentially achieve this monumental breakthrough would be you and Ayumu, but I sensorily doubt that the showrunners would want to drop a mind-blowing, sensory overload nuke like that in a simple OVA. They probably want to go all out, and let it stew for a whole season. Season. Anyway, Shiki and Mei, fantastic duo, easily my number one love live ship, in this video at least. Alright, so that'll do it for this video. Hopefully you weren't overcome by unfiltered boredom. If not, let me know which ships you found yourself agreeing with, and share your personal thoughts on them. Heck, let me know which ones you strongly disagree with, so that we can have a nice, friendly chat about them. In fact, it can be so friendly that we should totally meet in person. I can even show you my sweet-looking baseball bat. So yeah, love live and shipping, two of my greatest passions in life. Which means I can talk about them for as long as you want. Anyway, that's all for today. See you around.